closing time, the close of an era. The great big spree, the jazz age, is over, all over. In the 1920s, the great American word was prosperity. Now the 30s have begun and there is a new word, depression. Little man, what now? Well, you can always sell surplus apples, five cents apiece on the street corner. And if you're bewildered, panicky at what's happening to you and your country, you aren't alone. One of America's biggest industrialists has openly admitted, I am afraid. Every man is afraid. Prosperity is just around the corner, say the hopeful headlines. But around the corners wind the lengthening bread lines, and a whole new class of citizens appears in American society, the new poor. And when private charity can no longer carry the burden, the states are forced to act. The New York governor, Franklin Roosevelt, is the first to supply direct emergency relief to the unemployed. The same paralysis that lames the cities blights the farms. And out in the country, too, men are asking, what's wrong? What's happening? Farm prices have dropped disastrously, and a man's work no longer brings him a just return. The threat of foreclosure, of losing house and home, spreads through the conservative farmlands, and radical talk is boiling into action. <laughs> In Iowa, the Farmers' Holiday Association organizes to block the flow of farm product to the city in an attempt to force prices up. It is illegal action. But one farmer says, seems to me there was a tea party in Boston that was illegal too. crisis spreads. From all over the country, unemployed veterans of World War I march on Washington, 15,000 of them. They demand immediate payment of a cash bonus promised them for the future. They need it now. They want it now. But the Senate votes no, and authorities see in the bonus marchers a mob animated by the spirit of revolution, a menace to the nation's capital. Troops disperse the veterans and burn down their shanty settlement. Since the Civil War has such pressure, political, economic, social, centered on the White House. In the face of a hostile press and a divided Congress, Herbert Hoover makes unprecedented use of government power to encourage recovery. But his fundamental faith is in the rugged individualism of the American people and in private enterprise. Economic depression, he says, cannot be cured by legislative action. But the basic causes of the deepening crisis remain stubbornly obscure even to the business leaders summoned to the White House. The explanation offered by humorist Robert Benchley is as good as any. Now, what were the primary causes of the Depression, as we called it? Overproduction, maladjustments in gold distribution, overproduction, deflation, too little thyroid secretion or flux disease, too much vermouth, overproduction, and by the same token, underproduction. Then too, there was the Gulf Stream. All of these helped lead to inflation, deflation, and overproduction, with a consequent depression. Many are beyond joking. 
A report from Detroit says men are sitting in the parks all day long, out of work, muttering to themselves. Some succumb to apathy. Some are swept by alarm, and bank after bank across the country is hit by panic withdrawals. New lines appear on American streets, depositors swarming to snatch out what savings they have left before it's too late. Banks by the hundreds, by the thousands, are forced to close. On the eve of the presidential election of 1932, the whole financial system quakes and totters. A bitter electorate of frightened people turns overwhelmingly against the party in power, turns hopefully toward a new national leader, Franklin D. Roosevelt. His campaign promise, a new deal. His campaign song, happy days are here again. Franklin Delano Roosevelt on his inauguration day. In the tension and antagonisms of the moment, the defeated president and the president-to-be barely speak as they ride together to the Capitol for the swearing-in ceremony. The day is overcast and sullen, shadowed by uncertainty in Washington and throughout the land. For America, something is ending this day. Something is beginning, and no man can tell what. One thing only is certain on this 4th of March, 1933. The old order changeth, yielding place to new. From the 32nd president of the United States in his inaugural address come words that electrify a people desperate for hope and assurance. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Whatever may be said of him, this the people sense. He is not afraid. That night, the new president promptly breaks with tradition. He does not attend the inaugural ball. Instead, he launches immediately on a program of legislation and reform without precedent in American history. The New Deal begins at once. This nation, he has said, asks for action, and action now. Action begins next day, Sunday. With Secretary of the Treasury Wooden, the President orders every bank in the nation to close. The holiday begins in a holiday mood for most. But to assure the public that the banks will reopen safely, the president hits upon his most popular innovation, an informal report direct to the man on the street, the fireside chat. Let me make it clear that the banks will take care of all needs. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. <laughs> Now, every train to Washington brings its cargo of experts to join the great assault on the Depression. Economists, sociologists, statisticians, agronomists, idealists, world savers. Each with a pet panacea, a surefire system to save the country. Somebody writes a poem about it. Tramp, tramp, the grand old party's breaking camp. Blare of bugles, din, din. The New Deal is moving in. Along with master politicians like James Farley and Louis Howe, the president surrounds himself with bright young college professors, such as Raymond Moley, Rexford Guy Tugwell, and Adolph Burley, men who generate new ideas and new policies. They are the brain trust of the Roosevelt Revolution. Bill after bill pours into Congress from the White House. 
Whatever Roosevelt wants, he gets. The House is burning down, says the Republican floor leader. So give the president anything he needs to put out the fire. Through 100 historic days of a special session, every New Deal measure passes without question. The country demands bold, persistent experimentation, the president says, and the country gets it. Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace launches the AAA, a program for managing and controlling America's farm resources. The new Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, administers the PWA, a program of public works designed to create jobs for the unemployed. The Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins, first woman cabinet member, expert in employment problems, an advocate of economic planning. Something like a war psychology grips Washington as the shakeup in government goes on night and day by headlong trial and error. Everything from federal theater projects to legalizing light wines and 3.2 beer. And an alphabetical avalanche of new offices and agencies. FERA, CCC, TVA. But the most urgent measure in 1933 is NRA, a system of codes administered by General Hugh Johnson to regulate wages, hours, and employment. Even Will Rogers gets behind it. Hello. This is, uh, this is taken in the, uh, in the uh, general, part of General uh, Johnson's uh, NRA headquarters. I have been here all night and all the day working with him on uh, a comedian's code, code for comedians. And we've had quite an argument. He wants to include the senators and the congressmen in this, and I'm fighting against that, uh, because us amateurs do not want to be classed with professionals. And I'm arguing with this guy, Johnson, and he's tough, boy, he's tough, this fella. The thing has got to work. Uh, this whole NRA system has got to work or else. I mean, and, and or they say, or else what? Well, just else. There ain't going to be nothing if it don't work. So all America rallies round the Blue Eagle, the symbol of NRA, the National Recovery Act. Will it work? Will it spread employment and raise wages? Well, Hugh Johnson has no doubt. If every employer will live up to the code or to his agreement under which he got the Blue Eagle, if every consumer will buy under the Blue Eagle and buy generously now to the very full of his prudent needs, American business and employment will show the biggest spurt that it has known for years, and we shall be uh, on our way out of this depression before snow flies. Government by ballyhoo, some call it, and denounce NRA as national regimentation, alien to the American way. But most are caught up in the color and excitement of the times. Hasn't Roosevelt said, we are on our way and heading in the right direction? Prohibition passes out. At 35 and a half minutes past three on December 5th, 1933, Utah becomes the 36th state to ratify the 21st Amendment, repealing the 18th. Beer is back, not just 3.2, but real beer. Eight states remain dry, but in the other 40, what's yours? Anything goes. <laughs>
different times. And who can say what will happen before another morning rolls around? Things are going on all the time nowadays that would have seemed impossible a few years ago. Some people worry what effect all these changes and reforms will have in the long run. But the new dealers say people don't eat in the long run, they eat every day. So the changes keep coming. What's going to happen next? We don't know. We can't say. We're wondering. One thing that's happening, men are going to work for the government by the millions on new buildings, roads, schools, bridges, anything to get the forgotten man, as Roosevelt calls him, off the bread lines and on the job, any job. WPA. It stands for Works Progress Administration, but critics say it really means we poke along. The boondoggling, the shovel leaning, becomes the target for anti-administration wits. And against the most spectacular of New Deal projects, TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, opponents charge unfair government competition with private business. But TVA generates cheap power for millions of homes and factories in a blighted area. It works and it grows. Few object to the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. It takes thousands of young men out of the towns and cities where there is nothing for them to do and puts them in government camps where there is plenty to do. Work that conserves the soil and replenishes the forests. On the farmland, a paradox. The New Deal promises the more abundant life, but in the farm belt, abundance is a burden. Now, government agents go about preaching the gospel of crop control, the economics of scarcity. Farmers are paid not to plant. The AAA, the Agriculture Adjustment Act, seeks to bolster farm income by ordering crops plowed under, and millions of acres of wheat, cotton, corn are left unplanted. And yet, men are hungry. That such measures are needed, says Secretary Wallace, is a shocking comment on our civilization. But farm prices do go up, farm income rises. To the troubles man makes for himself in the 30s, nature adds disasters of her own. Hurricanes, floods, drought. Across the Great Plains from the Texas Panhandle to the Canadian border, the exhausted earth, broken by the plow, parched and eroded, begins to blow away in great black blizzards. The dust storms bring darkness at noon. Lifetime turned to dust, a way of life ended. By the thousands, they abandon their homes, flee the dust bowl. The uprooted of Oklahoma give a name to the new breed of dispossessed Americans, Okies. Steinbeck tells the tale that is told of the Okies, and he calls it the Grapes of Wrath. They took the migrant way to the west. In the daylight, they scuttled like bugs to the westward, and as the dark caught them, they clustered like bugs near to shelter and to water. And because they were lonely and perplexed, because they had all come from a place of sadness and worry and defeat, and because they were all going to a new mysterious place, they huddled together. They talked together. They shared their lives. They were not farm men anymore, but migrant men. 
The voice of the demagogue is heard in the land. Senator Huey Long of Louisiana. With his rabble-rousing shout of share the wealth, he makes his bid to become dictator of America. The Reverend Gerald L. K. Smith, Father Charles E. Coughlin, Dr. Francis E. Townsend. Together and on their own, they woo the frustrated and bewildered with slogans and panaceas. Dr. Townsend calls his patented cure-all the old age revolving pension plan, and he claims five million followers. The radio priest, Father Coughlin, wins a growing following by scoffing at democracy and playing on racial prejudice. Thousands of Americans, fearful of the expanding threat of communism from the radical left, turn in their anxiety to the extreme right. The Reverend Gerald Smith falls heir to the share of the wealth movement when a political enemy murders Huey Long. I always talk loud, says the Reverend Gerald Smith, and too many come to listen and believe. It can't happen here, the saying goes, but it seems to be. From Hyde Park on the Hudson, a different voice. Franklin Roosevelt relaxes with his wife and grandchildren at his ancestral home. Out of this patrician background has come his sweeping program of social security and reform, a lifetime in public service. Despite inherited wealth and privileged position, he has somehow acquired the common touch that endears him to the common man. A personal magnetism and inner buoyancy have smoothed his path in politics. Once he said to Orson Welles, you and I are the two best actors in America. His second home is Warm Springs, Georgia, where he finds relief in the mineral waters. Infantile paralysis deprived him of the use of his legs at the age of 39. The President of the United States is the first man in history to achieve world stature without the ability to walk. His affliction, says his wife Eleanor, gave him strength and courage he had not had before. But though a cripple, he is no invalid. At Warm Springs, he becomes Dr. Roosevelt and frolics with his fellow victims whom he calls my gang. We are going to make it a crusade, says Roosevelt of his campaign for re-election in 1936. Though major New Deal measures like NRA and AAA have been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, millions of men have been put to work, and the National Business Index has almost doubled. All across the land, the president is hailed as a gay crusader who has led his nation out of the economic wilderness without dictatorship or revolution. To the many who feel that happy days are here again, he is FDR, the champ. A counter crusade rolls across the country led by the Republican candidate, Alf M. Landon, able governor of Kansas, successful oil man, middle of the road conservative. For him and for many, the basic campaign issue is that of governmental power and its abuse. He says, The question raised for this issue, what powers the government shall have and what powers it shall not have, can be the difference between representative government and an organized authority wielded by one man. Against that one man, that man in the White House, the Republicans charge that he is destroying the American way of life, that he is leading the country down the road to socialism, that he is Franklin Deficit Roosevelt, whose spending has increased the public debt by billions. Let's make it a Landon slide. Election night, 1936. Roosevelt takes every state in the Union but Maine and Vermont and wins huge majorities in both houses of Congress. It is the greatest political sweep in history. During his campaign, 
the president said, this generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. The United States, moving toward that destiny, enters the second term of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Without much disturbing the old accustomed ways, The atmosphere has changed. Sure, there's still a good deal of unemployment around, but now many who are working have the five-day week. And more important, the feeling of imminent disaster, the fear of economic collapse is gone. There's always plenty to talk about in the 30s, and not all of it economic or political by any means. Some stories even push the depression off the front pages. They're queuing up by the hundreds at the courthouse in Flemington, New Jersey, where the all-American hero of the 1920s has become the tragic figure of the 30s. Charles A. Lindbergh, the Lone Eagle, Lucky Lindy, his wife, Anne, and the kidnapped killer of their son, Bruno Hauptmann once a German machine gunner and now on trial for his life in a drama whose unfolding has shocked and fascinated America and the world. The crime of the century. Now all the fame of Lindbergh's solo flight to Paris and all the glory that it brought him has turned to ashes. Now, all that is left of his child is some tattered clothing exhibited to convict the child's killer. His name was Charles Augustus Lindbergh, Jr. To escape publicity and curiosity seekers, his parents had moved to an isolated estate in Hopewell, New Jersey. But the marauder came by night with a homemade ladder and stole the child away. Weeks later, after $50,000 in ransom had been paid in vain, the baby was found dead. One of the greatest American manhunts ended when Bruno Hauptmann was caught passing the ransom money, and the crime of the century became the trial of the century. The National Broadcasting Company presents a special bulletin from the Press Radio News. Trenton, New Jersey. Bruno Richard Hauptmann was electrocuted at 8.47 tonight for the murder of the Lindbergh baby. News, comedy, music. The golden age of radio. <laughs> but Mr. Allen, it isn't a thing. This is an old friend of yours from the days of Oldville. If it's Otto the train seal, throw him a fish and tell him I'm busy. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Fred. If you'll just take your nose, that one you used to talk through, out of that microphone, <laughs> you'll see that it's me. Oh, Jack! Jack Benny! Well, I'm... Ter wait a minute. There's a reception goes in there for... Well, doesn't have... I'd like you to hear another concert with the NBC Symphony Orchestra under its celebrated conductor, Arturo Toscanini. regular passenger flight from Frankfurt, Germany, the dirigible Hindenburg approaches its destination, Lakehurst, New Jersey. Skip a 
was no doubt busting with activity, as we can see. Orders are shouted to the crew. The passengers probably lining the windows, looking down at the field ahead of them, getting their glimpse of the mooring mast. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship, and uh, it's been taken a hold up down on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, slacked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from burst into flames. Wait, wait, get this started, get this started. It's right, it's right, it's right, it's terrible. Oh, my, get out of the way, please. It's burning, bursting into flames, and it's falling on the morning fast. All the folks between the sisters are terrible. This is one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's just the worst catastrophe. Four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flames crashing to the ground, not quite to the boring mass. All the humanity and all the fans just screaming around. A time of tragedies, a time of changes, big ones and small. The birth rate has fallen, and women's skirts are lower, too. They're selling a lot more cars these days, and now the word is recovery. Noontime is still lunchtime, but Americans, absorbed in what is happening in their own country to their own lives, begin to catch distant rumbles from beyond their borders. The world begins to press in on them as they go their familiar ways. Say, that's some story coming out of England. In England, too, crisis and change. The legendary Prince of Wales, who became Edward VIII, has abdicated. The crown that custom and tradition forced him to reject for the love of a twice-divorced American woman is passing to his younger brother, the Duke of York. Now there is a new king. The empire, shaken and split by the abdication, closes ranks behind... Long live the king. Their majesties, Queen Elizabeth and King George, with their daughters, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret. A month later, at a villa in France, Edward, now Duke of Windsor, marries Wallace Warfield Simpson of Baltimore. In his abdication speech, he said, I have found it impossible to discharge my duties as king as I should wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. What the American journalist H.L. Mencken calls the greatest story since the resurrection is over. At home, the neighborhood news is more humdrum. A letter from a son at a CCC camp, perhaps. The usual births, deaths, and marriages in the local paper. The weekly meeting of the afternoon discussion group on current events. And these days, goodness knows, there is much to discuss. Europe, it seems, isn't all royal romance and new crowned kings. Only force rules. The dictator Hitler is telling the German people. Force is the first law. Defying the Treaty of Versailles, he sends his Nazi troops into the demilitarized Rhineland. Before the 30s are half over, all major international treaties are broken. According to Hitler, in eternal peace, mankind perishes. But when dictators begin to march, it is peace that begins to perish. We have buried the putrid corpse of liberty, the dictator Mussolini tells the Italian people. And he says, war alone puts the stamp of nobility upon the peoples who have the courage to face it. For the imperial glory of fascism, he has begun his own little war by sending his troops to conquer defenseless Ethiopia. To Geneva, Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, his country overrun, his people bombed and gassed, 
to address the League of Nations. I come to bear witness against the crime perpetrated against my people and to give Europe warning of the doom that awaits it if it should bow before the accomplished fact. Italian aggression and gas have set humanity. Humanity fails the test. The Spanish agony begins. The civil war that ravages Spain divides the West as well. Some see in General Franco's revolt a crusade against godless communism. Others see in it only the spread of fascism and dictatorship. On Franco's side, Nazi bombers and Italian troops. On the Republican side, Red volunteers and Soviet support. In between, the Spanish people. No communist, no fascist is Emperor Hirohito of Japan, but his faith is Bushido, the way of the warrior, and it too means aggression. His troops flood into Manchuria and China, ignoring treaties and American protests. Says President Roosevelt, the peace, the freedom, and the security of 90% of the world is being jeopardized by the remaining 10%. A United States gunboat, the Panay, is attacked without cause or warning while on patrol on the Yangtze River. A sneak attack from the air. Two American sailors die and more are wounded. But the Japanese apologize and stateside reaction to the incident is mild. What was it that Philadelphia newspaper said when Japanese aggression began? The American people don't give a hoot in a rain barrel who controls North China. Here's how. Isn't this a lovely party? I finally finished Gone with the Wind. Have you seen the headlines? Maybe the communists are right at that. At least they want a united front against aggression. Yes, all we do is compromise and retreat. That's because Roosevelt is a fascist. Nonsense, he's a red. What's going to happen next? We don't know, we can't say. We're wondering. Oh well, the world will keep until tomorrow. It's supper time. It is an increasingly urbanized and mechanized America with quickening pace and tempo in city life, in American living. It's a fast buck, try anything time, and millions give the Irish sweepstakes a whirl. And if you don't hit, there's always bank night at the movies. Nobody hits as big in the 30s as champion Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, even if the German Max Schmeling did beat him once. Lewis may not know it, says Schmeling of their return bout, but deep down inside, he's afraid of me. Lewis replies in round one. A new kind of jazz, something called swing, and Benny Goodman is the king of it. It starts in the dance joints, jams the theaters, even raises the roof at classical Carnegie Hall. And with it comes a new breed of flaming youth, the jitterbug. <laughs>
In the general upheaval of the times, even the social register succumbs to new phenomena. Cafe society, the glamour girl, the candid camera. Those who have it spend it now that the panic seems to be passed and a little boom seems to be on. They're saying you can't take it with you, so wake up and live. No vulgar jitterbugging here, Susie Q. But any evening, any day, you'll find us all doing the Lambeth Walk. Hoy. Washington, another party. The dignitaries of the New Deal gather for the traditional victory dinner that celebrates their triumph at the presidential polls. If Franklin Roosevelt's first term began at a time of crisis for the country, his second begins at a time of crisis for the New Deal. If his first four years were marked by controversy and contention, his second four start with a political bombshell that divides the nation and splits his own party. He attacks the Supreme Court. And I defy anyone to read the opinions concerning the AAA, the Railroad Retirement Act, the National Recovery Act, the Guppy Coal Act, and the New York Minimum Wage Law, and tell us exactly what, if anything, we can do for the industrial worker in this session of the Congress with any reasonable certainty that what we do will not be nullified as unconstitutional. If we would keep faith, faith with those who had faith in us, if we would make democracy succeed, I say we must act now. The president calls on Congress to support his fight against what he terms the horse and buggy decisions of the Supreme Court. He asks that the court be liberalized by adding more and younger justices, calling his program court reform. But opponents denounce it as court packing, and Roosevelt suffers a jolting setback when his plan is decisively rejected. The New Deal honeymoon is over. But another major New Deal measure sponsored by Senator Robert Wagner of New York is unexpectedly approved by the Supreme Court and new life is given to the American labor movement. Now, backed by the provisions of the Wagner Labor Relations Act, using it as their Magna Carta, the unions recruit millions of members in a nationwide drive for collective bargaining, the closed shop, higher wages, better working conditions. Strikes everywhere in steel, oil, textiles. A surge of strikes. And a new kind of strike as well. Workers refuse to leave the automobile plants and hold them like fortresses, chanting, when the boss won't talk, don't take a walk, sit down, sit down. of civil war, resistance by management against the rising tide of organizing, defiance of court injunctions by labor, violence by pickets and police, a kind of civil war.
a victory for union recognition and collective bargaining. Congress puts a ceiling over hours and a floor under wages. This does not abate the acute economic recession that the country now experiences, but the last great domestic conflict of the decade is over. Other parades in the 30s. American columns keeping cadence with their European counterparts. Here in the United States, the German-American Bund openly imitates the strut and slogans of the Nazi stormtroops. In the march of the totalitarians, in the spread of fascism and the lure of communism, some Americans see the wave of the future. here, in Madison Square Garden, a public demonstration of how dictatorships deal with anyone who dares rise up and protest. who would destroy democracy, there are also those who will defend it. For the first time in history, the King and Queen of England visit the United States, and Secretary of State Cordell Hull greets them in Washington. Their visit is an act of Anglo-American friendship. And goodwill is growing scarce in the world. Friendships are rare. Germany has overrun Austria and Czechoslovakia. Italy has invaded Albania. Japan is extending her aggression in China. The year is 1939. The month is June. There is still time for a brief moment of joyous pomp and pageantry in a sullen world girding for war. short when you reach September. Trilon and Perisphere bravely symbolize the theme of the New York World's Fair, the world of tomorrow. But now, in the world of today, war has come and Europe is already dark. The 30s are ending. Another era is passing. Through the fun and fantasy of the fair, something whispers it is later than you think. president has said, many voices are heard as we face a great decision. Comfort says, tarry a while. Opportunism says, this is a good spot. Timidity asks, how difficult is the road ahead? Shall we pause now and turn our back upon the road that lies ahead? Shall we call this the promised land? Or shall we continue on our way? For each age is a dream that is dying, or one that is coming to birth.